Thank you for listening to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Sign up to our Patreon to receive bonus content, live streams, and our weekly newsletter with money off books and museum visits as well, plus early access to all live show tickets. That's patreon.com slash we have ways. I think we need, we need at first to, um, to cast our mind back to the Belgium of the winter of 1944. Um, and you all need to wrap up now and feel very cold. Yeah. <laughs> um, and imagine the snow and the ice outside um, and you're clustering in here because it's the warmest possible place to be. Um, and you're all huddling up together because you're so cold. Um, got it? Does that make? <laughs> it's so easy to relate to right now, isn't it? Freezing cold, <laughs> ice. So John, if you didn't know, is in charge of, of uh, uh, We Have Ways in, in the States, which is an awesome responsibility. Um, and uh, we're very bloody lucky to get him over here, actually, um, to talk about one of his hobby horses uh, and, and one of mine. Um, so Battle of the Bulge, 1944. Um, what we'll do is about half an hour's chatter um, and then uh, some time for questions afterwards. So first of all, let's, let's kick off with a, a counterfactual. John, did the Battle of the Bulge have any remote chance of succeeding? From the German perspective? From the German perspective. I, I mean, I don't think so. Um, I mean, even as it was, everything had to go right, and a lot did go right for the Germans in terms of weather. Uh, they got the element of surprise. They, uh, they're happy enough to, to nail a, an American sector that's really thinly held. Uh, but were they really getting to Antwerp? When you think about the larger strategic object of the, the offensive, are they getting to Antwerp? Are they going to cut off the uh, British 21st Army Group from the, the U.S. military forces to the south? I think that's highly unlikely. But if we even get the broader scope, the idea of fracturing the coalition in such a way that all of a sudden the Anglo-Americans are going to join forces or at least uh, negotiate some sort of end to the war uh, short of unconditional surrender, I think is, is really quite you know, fantastical. I mean, that's, that, that, that's my reading, and, and the Germans have never realized just how large Schaeff is the Allied Expeditionary Force headquarters under Eisenhower, full of not just Americans, but Brits and Canadians and uh, a lot of other coalitions, uh, coalition officers. So that, that coalition is as strong as glue, and you've not just got to split the armies apart, you've got to sow distrust between them. And they're never, ever going to achieve that, are they? No, and, and, and even, I mean, I think, you know, the object is to split them from the Soviets. So in that sense, Hitler is anticipating the Cold War. Uh, so he's ahead of his time on some level. But also, what he doesn't quite realize until it's too late is that the only thing that does hold them together is him. Uh, as long as Hitler's around, the Soviets, the British, the Americans will actually get along well enough at least to take him down. And I don't know if there's anything that's going to happen in the bulge that's ever going to change that, that we could envision at least. Um, I mean, yeah. the parallel I always like to, to, to draw between the two operations is, is Market Garden, which is about 60 miles uh, into enemy terrain um, with an armoured column going down a pretty much a single route um, with mostly with armour, with uh, air cover, um, but again, taking the Germans by surprise. And the bulge, which is pretty much the same, but 120 miles um, yeah. Into German held territory, into Allied held territory, but with no air cover at all. And if the Allies can't achieve Market Garden, the Germans are highly unlikely to be able to achieve yeah. Um, the Yeah, bulge. it's a great point because at Market Garden, what happens? The Germans basically threaten both flanks. Uh, the Allies are very much in a position to do that on a much more massive level, um, you know, during, during the bulge, and that's exactly what does happen. You know, to some extent. So it's just, uh, and I think many of Hitler's commanders understood that this was not a good idea. Um, but, you know, what were they going to do? And in effect, it's ironically, it's Market Garden that inspires him to, to launch this offensive, at least according to what he will say, um, that, that he decides at that point, I've got to launch an offensive somewhere in the West, you know, within a couple of months or whatever it was going to be. Um, you know, but he's, he's uh, I mean, he's, it's just fanciful to think that somehow he's going to be able to get to Antwerp and stay there, even if he does. That flank is going to be threatened on either side, like, you know, like, you know, and it's similar to Market Garden. Mm. So um, it's just the, the offensive doesn't make sense uh, in that respect. But of course, the other thing, this is one of the things that I, that I like to emphasize a lot. 
Um, we can look at that as historians 80 years later. If we happen to be one of those poor GIs in the middle of that corridor where the Germans are coming, it really does seem like the world is ending. Um, you are now all of a sudden outgunned, you're outnumbered, uh, you're outsupplied, at least at that point of the spear. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got a really tough uh, row in front of you. And then and, and the question is how morale back home is going to react to this too. And I think Hitler's targeting that on some level as well. So lo lots of um, sort of strategic issues. So um, th this is one where, um, I mean, it's a predominantly US Army battle. Um, and they are at war as much with terrain and weather as they are with the Germans. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, the weather's a nightmare. I mean, it, you know, and, and certainly in terms of getting your air support, I mean, that's the biggest reason the weather's a nightmare, uh, at least for the first, you know, five, six days, roughly. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the terrain is extremely difficult to move in. Um, you've got a kind of a narrow road net. How many have been to the Ardennes, to that area? Yeah, so you, you know the, the sense of that choke pointing in the towns, that the tendency, and, and a lot of the heavy uh, forested terrain that you've got there. Uh, the gorges, that, that kind of effect as well, really, uh, I think it makes it tough for the attackers, of course, obviously, but for the defenders, too, in terms of having any maneuver space uh, to, to retreat and then counterattack or whatever it's going to be. There's, there's a tendency to, to really take a stand uh, either inside or outside the, the sort of crossroads or choke point towns. And uh, that really, to some extent, becomes the key terrain for the Americans, but uh, you know, then, then there's supply issues too. And that's the other thing that's gonna really affect your life as a soldier. They can't get reinforcements to you, they can't get supplies to you, wherever you happen to be on that front for the first few days. What do you think Hitler, what do you think inspired Hitler to, to launch the attack in the Ardennes? Uh, well, I think it's probably the 1940 experience, isn't it? That, uh, you know, that the Germans had very good success, famously, of course, getting through the Ardennes in 1940. Which is Rommel. Taken, yeah, Rommel yeah. as a division commander at that point. Uh, and I think they kind of want to redo it, and that, that certainly does make some sense. It's also, I think they know enough about the, the Allied lines to know that uh, it's a thinly held front. Uh, General Bradley... You know, he's not dumb. He's not just all of a sudden not realizing, oh, you know, I'm just going to spread my front, fry my front thin. Um, he, he just realizes, hey, I got to be thin somewhere, given the operational situation right now, um, you know, and the troops I have at my disposal. And I'm going to let the terrain do some defending for me because it was thought that the Ardennes would be too tough for armor and maneuver and mechanized warfare, which wasn't quite true. But, um, you know, he just just gets caught at the wrong time in that respect. Uh, but yeah, from the, from, the, from the German perspective too, I mean, there is some prospect of tactical success here. At the strategic level, that's another matter, Once you, if you can get beyond the Meuse River and go farther north. Now, I mean, you, you, you employ quite a lot of military terminology when we're, we're, we're chatting like this. And you've been the official history of the um, cotton bailers. Which yeah, 7th a, Infantry. Yeah. Um, and they, they were further south, weren't they? They weren't involved yeah. in the bulge. But, as a wider sort of reflection on, on the U.S. Army today, what does the Battle of the Bulge mean to the U.S. Army mm. today? Yeah, the Battle of the Bulge is a cautionary tale for the U.S. Army. It's one of our many uh, intelligence failures, it seems like. They, they add up a little bit after Pearl Harbor. Um, why we didn't know this was going to happen. That becomes yeah. the kind of recrimination yeah. for a long period of time. And there's a lot of blame to go around. I think some of it is just some bad luck uh, in terms of the bad weather, uh, grounding some recon flights, uh, some of it is, is and we're over reliance you know, on on ultra and the Bletchley exactly. Park secret. Yeah, and I, and I think a kind of a victory disease yeah. even after Market Garden, what happened in the fall. There's a bit yeah. of a victory disease of be believing the Germans don't have this capability. Um, so I think the, the battle is studied on that level a lot. It's also studied as a story of resilience because it really, you know, it, it could have been worse in terms of units folding up, mm. people being captured, uh, the level of destruction, uh, morale on the home front, whatever. And, and I think that there, there really is, you know, at the operational level, there's some great lessons that, that are learned there about what small groups of soldiers can do in times of terrible adversity. So, um, you know, I'll give you just one example. Um, a, a company from the 110th Infantry Regiment, 28th Division, that's the Bloody Bucket Pennsylvania National Guard, uh, that's cut off uh, in a town called Hosingen, a, you know, right at the, the, the forefront of the, the German offensive. And... I mean, they inflict a tremendous amount of damage on the on the attacking forces, probably on a factor of, you know, anywhere from two and a half to five to one, you know, if not further. 
And that's a little bit of a microcosm for what's happening, especially in these first three to four days when you really get, you get punched in the face really badly. Uh, but how are you reacting? And, and I think by and large, the American soldiers are causing enough trouble for the Germans to cost them the, the valuable resource of time, which they can never replace. And I think Hosingen is really kind of the, the, one of the prime examples of that whole thing. I mean, you asked earlier how many people have been to the, the, the Ardennes area, and I think that's a, a sort of key question to ask because James and Al have, have started doing their podcast on sort of walking the ground. Mm. Um, and Normandy is well walked and, and well picked over, but the Ardennes is um, such a more remote place with fewer places to stay, vast areas of woodland that no one ever visits. Um, and yet, if you've got maps from the war or accounts, you can, uh, you can walk the ground, and of course, the ground never changes. So you can, you know, these places sort of suddenly come to life, especially if you've got a, a veteran's account with you and some maps or, or photographs. Um, and to me, that's always the Second World War sort of writ large. You, it, it, it leaps out at you because there's the, all the foxholes are still there, aren't they? Yeah. And the, the, the ruined buildings and uh, uh, sort of bullet holes in you know, stonework and all the rest of it. Absolutely. And it's a very special place. Yeah, I mean, you've been on so many staff rides there and has explored the ground, you know, massively, too. Um, I mean, to me, there's a there's an eeriness about the place. And uh, th there's a sense in a lot of these towns. It's ghostly, isn't it? It is, yeah. of what happened there. And, of course, like you said, the foxholes, and not just the famous ones, you know, near Foy, the, the, the uh, Band of Easy Brothers, Company, yeah. uh, Easy Company foxholes, but you can go to other places, too. And, of course, this has been done a lot over the years of, uh, local historians who know the ground extremely mm. well, finding specific fighting positions for the descendants of veterans, mm. or even, of course, eventually finding the remains sometimes or whatever. There is a kind of a, you know, unusual, I guess, I suppose, in a lot of Western Europe, a kind of passed over aspect to the place. And, uh, and, and it does, it gives this, this kind of eerie and forlorn kind of feel to it, in, in my view. And, it, and to me, it's always too, um, the, the memory of this is kind of forefront, which isn't always the case at, at other battle areas where redevelopment comes in, time moves on, things, other things happen. Um, the, the Ardennes is the Ardennes in terms, like you said, the ground doesn't change. And I think that allows us to understand it maybe a little bit better. I mean, it is a horrible place to be in midwinter and to fight. Um, especially if you've got no situational awareness. The Germans are all around you somewhere, but you don't know where they are. Um, you've run out of, um, you don't have enough warm clothing because there is no such thing as winter kit and summer kit. It's just what you were issued with on, in Normandy and you, you've carried on and your, you know, your rations or whatever you've got in your pockets, but, but nothing else because all the logistics chain has broken down by that. Um, so, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, this is not just a story of resilience. This is... The, I mean, it's the U.S. Army's biggest battle, I think, mm -hmm. in terms of numbers of people involved. Um, but it's their finest hour. This is when all the odds are against them in the first few days. And then they turn the whole situation around almost against the odds um, and triumph against the Germans. And, you know, as, as time goes on, perhaps they are always going to. But they did it quicker and they did it more effectively. Um, and when you look at the, the sort of awesome power the Germans employ in the first few days, I mean, that's a hell of an achievement, isn't it? It is. You know, weirdly, I mean, this will sound odd, but weirdly, I think the most uplifting part of the battle is that first 10 days when we're on our back foot because you're seeing um, so many of these incredible small unit actions yeah. where uh, the, the Americans are, are just holding on. Uh, against massive, uh, overwhelming odds in, in many respects. And so it's markedly different. It, the bulge really kind of has two phases. That phase, I'd say the first 10 days when it's at least possible the Germans might get something of what they want out of this, and they're generally on the attack. But I'd say a day or two after Christmas, now it starts to swing the other way where the Americans are attacking to retake the ground. And the weather improves. So and, and the weather improves them. and allows yeah. you to do that. But then it becomes more like the rest of the Western European campaign, this ugly slugging match day by day of attacking and attriting your units. And, and eventually, you know, you get some you get some bad weather too mm. by around New Year's of, of heavy snow and, and ice, and it just becomes this nightmare. Um, so it's it's really kind of Hurtkin Forest-ish in, in that respect, you know, once you get to the, the later part of the battle in terms of the, the, uh, the casualties. That first 10 days, though, is a story of crisis and reaction. Uh, that I think does the, the high command reasonably well. Yes, they got surprised, and they, maybe they shouldn't have, but I but, think they reacted well. But on the other hand, at army level, 
General Hodges, particularly, doesn't react at all. In his case, view. yeah, I was thinking at the Eisenhower level, yeah, <laughs> this is not Hodges' finest hour. So he's the commander of the U.S. First Army, which really takes a lot of the brunt of the, of the offensive. And uh, Courtney Hodges was a long-serving soldier. He had seen a lot of combat in World War I. Um, he, uh, he was not Rose willing. through the ranks as well. He'd he, risen yeah. through the ranks. He had joined the Army as a private, you know, ends up as an Army commander. He was a fine man in terms of his, his personality and his character. Uh, but this is not his finest hour. He uh, he is really terribly surprised by this. Do we really, think he has uh, a nervous breakdown? Because it, he shuts possible. himself away. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, we're, we're still trying to kind of come to grips with that. And I, I think it's possible that he did. Uh, you know, the whole thing, his headquarters is at Spa, and we don't know where he is at any given point in time. And it really, there's a, there's a kind of power vacuum that is filled by his core commander, especially Joe Collins, the commander of 7th Corps, and, uh, and Matthew Ridgway, the commander of 18th Airborne Corps, who are West Point classmates and now are really going to be put in a position of doing a lot of that dirty work of stopping that part of the offensive around Christmas time. Now, this is north of Bastogne, which is the most famous part of the bulge, um, and, then, and then starting the, the, the turn back to, to attack them. So Hodges is really kind of co-opted. And it is kind of an interesting thing, too, and just like points of view about Hodges uh, a little bit later on. So he, his first army was going to be redeployed to the Pacific after the end of the war in Europe for the invasion of Japan. So Hodges went out there with members of the staff, and um, and so he had to work with a guy named Robert Richardson, a three-star, who was uh, Nimitz's highest-ranking army commander. And Richardson kept this incredible diary, and it was very uh, acerbic and very honest diary. And he just sort of ripped Hodges up and down and said, I can't believe an army commander who has so little presence, you know, who just doesn't seem like it. He seems like a private or whatever. And I, and I thought to myself, you know, maybe Hodges just wasn't the same person that he was earlier in the war. You know, maybe maybe this uh, took a bite out of him that just wasn't there. And he was never a great army commander. But I think he, uh, you know, he has he has some better moments in Normandy, I think, rather than rather than both. Let's, I mean, let's turn to the Germans for a second. Um, now, I guarantee in the model making tent there will be endless, endless <laughs> portrayals of, uh, of some of the you know, amazing panzers that the Germans deploy. Um, but the, the fifth and the seventh armies, which are both the two armies that have come all the way back from Normandy. Um, I mean, one thing that struck me when I was writing about them was was they had more horses than tanks yep. in their ranks, yep. um, and they had the same kind of horse horsepower in terms of numbers that they did in the First World War because both were mm. um, featured in the First World War. So they're nothing like as as um, powerful as the German war machine, even in ninety, even in uh, even before D-Day. Um, right. They are just a shadow of their former selves, so they're never going to be able to rise to the challenge of mounting this surprise attack and yeah. punching through German lines. Right. All they've got working for them is, is surprise. Yeah, I mean, surprise. And once that wears out within a day or two, now they're in some level of trouble. Um, what are they really going to be able to exploit these breakthroughs? I mean, that's the thing. If you don't have enough vehicles, if a lot of your, uh, your logistics are still horse-drawn, <laughs> if your infantry units are still primarily on foot, which they largely are. I mean, of course, there's mech infantry involved for the Germans in this campaign, but uh, there's nowhere near enough of it. And I, I think our, our perceptions tend to be molded this day because the Nazi regime um, wanted a lot of photography on the vehicles and the tanks yeah, yeah. and all that, all, and the planes to, to, to create that image. But if you were an actual German soldier, part of what you're doing is tending horses. Yeah, and, and the cameras like, had to turn off um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the camera film whenever horses appeared into the shots, mm -hmm. they never ever yeah. appear in the sort of propaganda movies. Exactly. They didn't want the horses to appear in the propaganda movies. It just didn't, it wasn't the right image. Uh, so the Germans were, I mean, by this point in time, nowhere near as mechanized as the Allied armies. Um, the U.S. Army had basically forgotten what horses were uh, by 1944. Mm -hmm. Everything is by vehicle and uh, by expectation almost, to, to the point where some American commanders worried that their light infantry were too soft expecting to be driven mm -hmm. everywhere, expecting mm -hmm. to have tanks help them with every attack or to have self-propelled artillery, that they'd gotten over-reliant on the, on the technology and the mechanization. And there's, of course, I think some merit to that. Uh, but I'd rather have that problem than, you know, be tending horses and, you know, that, that kind of... And, and one of the problems the Germans have is, is a lot of them don't know how to drive. Yeah. Not only do they not have enough fuel or vehicles, so they're reliant on capturing American vehicles with fuel, but they then can't drive them. So often when they they capture Americans, they, they ask for drivers to volunteer to drive these things. Yeah. Um, and some do, because that, that's a route to 
better rations or not being shot, the Germans aren't going to shoot the drivers. And that happens at the Malmedy massacre. Right, exactly. They don't shoot the drivers. Yeah. And, and also, there's so many other groups that are being marched east on foot. And some of these guys are wounded, of course. Uh, I mean, that really, that, to some extent, that's the worst part of the bulge is the thousands of prisoners uh, the Germans do capture. And that, that is a really tough go for most of these guys. So if you were a US POW who gets captured in the bulge at any point, and it's probably going to happen within that first three to four days mm. or so, um, you know, you're looking at a very difficult next six months in your life. Uh, you're probably going to survive, but I would say you're probably going to lose about 30 to 35 pounds on average because Germany's in a bad state. You're not going to be eating well. You're probably going to be moved around POW camp to POW camp. The biggest danger to your life in the meantime on your way on the way back to the camp is probably your own planes, uh, strafing trains, strafing columns, um, and all this happening in, in terrible weather. Um, you know, That's what it, happens to Kurt Vonnegut, doesn't he? Who, to Kurt Vonnegut, yeah. Who writes yeah, so Slaughterhouse he, exactly. Five, and he, yeah, Dresden. And, of course, he eventually is put to work cleaning up the, the mess in Dresden, writes Slaughterhouse Five based on that. And yeah, there's there's actually a kind of a uh, an over-concentration of some fairly educated soldiers. He was part of the ASTP program, which was Army Specialized Training Program. If you scored really high on the, the entry test, um, you could you could go to college degree on, on the, the government's dime. The thinking was at the end of that rainbow, you would uh, you'd be trained as an engineer, a linguist, or something like that, and you probably wouldn't be in combat. Well, and as an officer, it, the, what, it was office making officers as, as well, possibly, or maybe NCO, senior okay. NCO rank, or whatever it be. And uh, yeah, so you would um, you know you, you'd be in a pretty good spot. But as as it happened, they they basically eliminated the program because they needed so many combat soldiers. So a lot of these guys end up in combat units. Many of them end up in units that are right in the in the middle of the German offensive. Uh, famously in the 106th Infantry Division, which basically just is, uh, is destroyed. Two-thirds of it has to surrender. They run out of ammo. Uh, others are in the 99th Division or, you know, to and fro, you know, just ending up as combat infantrymen. And Vonnegut is, is an example of one of them. Uh, another guy, an example I'd give you, uh, he was in the 112th Infantry in the 28th Division. So he's on like, like that northern shoulder where they're taking the brunt of the 5th Panzer Army right in the, the middle of this bulge. And... Uh, this, this guy, his name was Hatton, and he ends up as the, the deputy, command, uh, deputy commissioner of Major League Baseball later in his life. You know? so, but he's, you know, his whole life was marked by that experience of fighting for his life in the Ardennes. He was fortunate enough not to be captured, not to be killed, uh, but the, you know, who knows how many others were and uh, were really never the same after that uh, among those who were captured. I think the only veteran I can think of who's still alive who was there was Mel Brooks. Yeah, Mel Brooks, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, there we are. Times against yeah. us, sadly. I mean, we, John and I could, you know, do this for a long time. I um, could blather on forever. So, you know. um, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>